All right, folks, thanks for being back here with us on Tennis Head. Noah Rubin, founder of Behind the Racket and the BTR Tour, joining us now. Noah, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me today. No problem. Thanks for joining us here on Tennis Head. Um, we're going to get into a lot of the stuff you're doing behind the scenes to start your own tour uh, and all that type of awesome stuff. But first, a lot of people remember back in 2017 when you played Roger Federer at the Australian Open, obviously a massive match for you. What was it like playing who many someone who many people consider the GOAT uh, on center court. How was that for you? What were some of your favorite memories? Yeah, I've played a, a lot of tennis matches, but I feel like uh, only a few get brought up all the time, which I don't you know, necessarily hate. Um, it was amazing playing Federer. I think what a lot of people don't remember is I actually had to qualify for that. I played three guys that were right around, I think most two of them were inside the top 100, which is tough to find for qualifying, which doesn't usually happen. And then played a, a fellow American in Bjorn Fratangelo. And that was my first actual full five-set match. That went five full sets. So, you know, I feel like I almost, you know, got something out of that tournament prior to playing Federer already. And then here I am in front of, you know, 14,000 people or whatever it is on Rod Laver Arena playing Roger Federer. And it was a mixture of stuff. I've, I've um, practiced or played exhibitions with all of the goats as you would like to say you know between i practiced with murray before warmed up nadal for quarters and semis and finals of like the you know i think the 2015 us open or whatever it was uh played um an exo with Djokovic, but federer i've never really had that interaction with obviously in the locker room but you know nothing like that so seeing him was kind of like looking at a computer or something and it was super strange but being the New Yorker I am, you know, I still want to like, you know, kick his ass. I mean, that's, that's who I was. So it was, um, you know, going through those three sets, obviously I had two set points in the third, which, you know, people love to remind me about. Um, but it's, it was just incredible to play somebody at Latin, that level. And, you know, I think, you know, we have a few goats in tennis. It's going to be a tough debate no matter what, but what Federer brings to the table I mean, for somebody, I attribute my speed to one of the things that has made me um, successful in tennis. He just made me feel slow. He, it, it was just a very unique match that I don't think I will feel against anybody else ever again. So, um, you know, that will always be with me, and that's why I play tennis. Yeah, no, su such a cool experience. I just, just quickly, like, I know getting through qualifiers as a qualifier and then getting into one of the majors is a, is a big deal for people who are in the qualifiers and then even winning your first match so when you, you when you get to the second round and you're playing Federer is there is there any part of you that's like ah, I've, I've made it this far that's a pretty good result but I know like you said you obviously still want to win that match is it hard to balance like wanting to win with just being like you know what I've made it this far yeah 100 percent. I think that's what some of the top players might have done better than me at this point you know looking at some of the guys and we're talking about such a small percentage of guys that have not only broken through but have broken through, broken through. And that, you know, comes with not being complacent. And I think even somebody as competitive as myself, of course, I wanted to beat Roger. I mean, I was throwing everything at him that day, but I think there was a part of me that was like, let's, let's enjoy this moment a little bit, you know, let's go out there and, and try to see if we can remember it. And still to this day, I mean, you know, I remember only what I've seen on the highlights, you know, it was a little bit of that blur that people talk about. And yeah, I don't think I slept many hours before the match when I played him. I mean, you know, for me at that point in time, you know, I was coming back from a few injuries, worked myself back into that area, you know, to get that opportunity. Again, actually, funny enough, people were counting out that Federer was supposed to retire at this point. You know, this was right um, in 2016, at the end of 2016, he was injured. He was out for many, many months. People were like, this is it for him. Obviously, we've said this many times. He lost... I think he lost uh, a set in the first round and then coming against me, I was like, you know, this is an opportunity actually. I mean, this is, this is something. And, and, you know, obviously fast forward a little bit and it was one of the best years he's ever had in professional tennis and to be kind of a part of that. And actually I re, um, you know, remember winning a challenger a few weeks later and watching him play Nadal in the finals of the Australian open. And one of the greatest matches I think I've seen or, you know, fifth sets that I've seen in a very long time. So to be a kind of a part of history in that way is amazing. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to kick his ass. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's fair. And it is, yeah, 2017 Australian Open was such a uh, special run for him. So yeah, you're you're one of the guys in that list uh, of <laughs> on his conquest, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so, you know, obviously you, you've stated your opinions on, on the tour as it is currently, and a lot of them are super interesting. And I think hold a lot of water. Um, what are some of the main changes you would make to the current ATP tour or tennis in general to help improve the game from a fan's perspective? Yeah, I think kind of, and not to go too deep into my tour yet, but I think when I was looking at my tour, I was looking at accessibility. You know, I think one of the things that always stuck with me, and, you know, I'm from New York, the US Open is my backyard. You know, I have friends that have played tennis their whole lives, and let's say they're in finance now, because a lot of them are. You know, they'll take off work to watch me play, and then my match is four hours delayed on a Tuesday, and they don't come back the next day because they're like, hey, no, we love you. We didn't even get to watch you play that day because we had to go to dinner. We had another important meeting, whatever the case may be. And we wasted a day on this. And I think this goes into a deeper problem. This goes into TV rights. This goes into fan engagement. And it's just not enough revenue streams because people don't want to be a part of it. I mean, there's a reason why Grand Slams keep getting dropped by, you know, major, major networks. There's a reason why, you know, I feel like we are losing fan engagement across the board. It's because, you know, you, for other sports, you know when they're going to play. You know, you have Sunday or Monday night football. You know that. You're excited about it. You're waiting for it. With tennis, I think it does a really poor job, and it tries to market this whole tournament. And it's like, yeah, I'm playing 2 p.m. this Tuesday. Nobody's showing up to watch that. You know, I'm lucky if somebody, if I'm on TV, I'm lucky if somebody puts it on TV. It's just, it's not accessible. So I think that's a tremendous thing that we have to change is looking at a fan and saying, hey, what do you want to see out of tennis? You obviously like it enough to be a part of it. But what would make it more enjoyable for you? I don't think we do that enough. And I don't think we're getting the next generation involved. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It, it is with so many matches going on and, and, and with TV schedules and work schedules for everyone, it does seem like that's not an ideal situation. Um, do you think that the current prize money and remuneration structure in tennis is fair? And if not, what would you change? Yeah, I mean, if you're, let's keep, you know, let's make it simple and argument's sake. If we're going to keep everything the same and we're not making any more money as is just budgeting wise and the distribution of prize money. Um, yeah, I think it has to change tremendously. I, I mean, I think the greatest idea that I'm not definitely not the first one to come up with this idea is just that prize money should be a bonus. It shouldn't be the only thing that's coming into somebody's paycheck. There should be a base salary based on ranking position, end of year or beginning of the year, however you want to do it. And then prize money is small dividends on top of that. And that's how it should be played. It shouldn't be, you know, this whole thing, which US Open, you know, and they brag about it all the time. And they're pretty transparent that they do it for this is they love being in the New York Times saying, hey, we have a $4 million champion prize money check. You know, how amazing is that comparing it to other sports? Look what we're giving for two weeks of tennis. Look what we're doing. But with that being said, you know, one, the distribution has to change. Let's say you take, because the guy that's most likely winning the US Open is probably okay financially. You know, he's most likely a top 10, maybe top to 15 player, most likely making 10 to $15 million with, you know, sponsorship. You know, if you take a million dollars away from the winner and you put that, you know, along the guys that are, you know, from 100 to 250 first round qualities, instead of, let's say, you know, 10 or $15,000 are making 25 or 30K, that's a game changer. You know, that, that's switching everything around. So, and, you know, for those four tournaments, you know, instead of making, you know, 40 grand or whatever, 45,000, you know, you're making now a hundred, you know, those, these are the things that can change that I think we have to change, but it's, um, you know, we still love those, you know, catchy head titles or whatever, you know, it's, it is what it is. Yeah, and it was interesting reading last year that, or in 2019, and this is not, most of this money didn't come from tennis, but Roger Federer is the highest paid athlete, sponsorships and prize money combined out of any athlete in the world, which is crazy because he like barely played even. Um, so yeah, it's it's, and I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve it, but I I, under, I totally understand what you mean that I think we could do a better job supporting like the next generation players and the people that are create the the bed layer of of tennis professionals. Yeah, I mean, just one thing quickly on that, if you don't mind, it's they actually on a graph a couple of years ago, they didn't do it this year, they actually showed prize money for sponsorships for the top 10 athletes. Right. And for Federer, obviously, and, and Tiger Woods as well, the two individual sports, their money was, I think it was like 85 or 90% for sponsorships. So that's just showing that the 
dollar amount is so minuscule for the prize money. Let that be dispersed to the guys that actually need that prize money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree for sure. What are the biggest mistakes? So just transitioning now to just more club players. A lot of the folks watching this will be, you know, hackers on the weekend like myself. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see amateur club players making on court? And what advice would you give them to help avoid these mistakes? <laughs> um, that's an interesting one. It's funny when I've, I've actually asked, gave a few lessons during COVID, you know, it was like the first time ever that I was kind of on the other side of the court. Um, and what I actually saw was overcomplicating the situation, whether it was the stroke, whether it was overthinking, it was just getting to a point where they were doing so much that it was actually going the opposite direction. It was actually hindering their tennis. So, um, you know, obviously you need somebody in your corner that's kind of helping you along, whether it's once a week you're taking a lesson with somebody that understands it, but keeping it simple. I mean, I see these guys serving and it's like a 40 step process, you know, before the ball gets tossed in the air. I'm like, it's a simple structure. You know, you toss it up, you have a throwing motion, it's there. And, and that's, it's a difficult thing to understand because, you know, and, and putting myself in somebody else's shoes, when I played golf, I got kind of that same remark and, you know, I went through it, but it is really keeping it simple. And I see these guys absolutely drenched in sweat because they want it so badly. And I love that but I think they have to tame it down just a bit. Right, so keep it simple is the, is the first step in the process, according to Noah Rubin, which uh, makes sense, makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, so tell us more about your BTR tour. Tell us why you've launched it and some of the innovations that you'll be bringing to professional tennis tournaments. Yeah, I mean, obviously we spoke about some of the issues that I've seen in professional tennis. Um, I think I used baseball as the example earlier on and. Sorry, anybody out there that's a tremendous baseball fan. I happen not to be. I love playing it. But I do get a little bit of bored, you know, going to a game after a while. But I'll enjoy it because you're not only there for the baseball game. You'll enjoy baseball. You get there. You're with friends. You have a beer. You have a hot dog. It's really, it's a fun atmosphere. Um, I actually think tennis is far more exciting up close and personal. I think there's a lot more action going on. But I think we could take away a little bit from that and say, hey, for an event like this, there could be other things going on. There could be more of an atmosphere surrounding it. And obviously some of the bigger events like Indian Wells, the US Open, the States, they try to do this, but I wanted to take it to another level. I wanted a festival feel to professional tennis, live music, outdoor vendors, activation, drinks, food trucks, like a real festival surrounding the highest level of tennis because there's no reason that you know, these guys can't play with a little bit of cheering going on. You know, I want that feel. I want that excitement. And I think we've gone to this point where we're doubling down on a, like a country club sport and we're just not that feeling anymore. You know, we are insane athletes. We're exciting to be around. I want people to cheer. I want the eight-year-old to scream at the top of his lungs. I want to get pumped up. And I think we have to change that mentality around. And that kind of starts with the BTR tour. Um, on top of that is the accessibility we spoke about. These are short events. You know, what I took kind of away from F1, which is an interesting sport, is that they have qualifying throughout the whole well, they have one day of qualifying, but they have practice throughout the whole week. You can kind of get behind it whenever you want. You're watching it. You're getting involved. But then they have their one day of, of you know, actual competition. So taking a little bit of that, obviously, we can't be exactly the same. But I wanted to make it where at least it was somewhat of a weekend event for the main draw, where you have a Friday to Sunday event. People are really not missing work for it necessarily. If they are, it's just one day. And then you have the semis and finals during the weekend. And then you have qualifying. You can have almost as, as large of a draw as you want for qualifying where guys are making money still, but it doesn't necessarily have to have the same feel because these are guys working to get into the main draw. And from there, you're making kind of this atmosphere during that weekend event that says, hey, you know, we're here, we're ready to support the main event and we're excited for it. We're going to have the fans cheering, the festival going, and that's kind of the atmosphere we're looking to create. So, you know, we've changed the rule book a little bit around, you know, besides the cheering, we're changing the point system, the scoring system to make it simpler, to get new fans into the sport. We just think we're really trying to reinvent tennis as a whole because it is exciting, but it hasn't been marketed the way it needed to be. And, you know, with that being said, and obviously COVID's been a, a little bit of a problem during this year for everybody, um, but we took, you know, we, we had to postpone our inaugural event um, from September to January, which we're really excited about. But we took a deep dive into the juniors this year. 
And we feel that, you know, true change and, and actual culture change starts at the ground up. And that's how families enter the sport. And that's with Phenom Tennis. For us, it's, it's raising the bar of junior events. It's having mental health at the core, which is something that I'm, you know, a proponent of with my Behind the Racket, which I started. But, you know, on-site sports psychologists, a minimum of three matches, which we've teamed up with UTR to create. So, again, between BTR Tour and Phenom Tennis is a lot of changes, which, you know, we don't have time to go through it all. But for us, it's, it's really, you know, bringing more people to the sport and allowing you to enter the sport the way you want to. Yeah, for sure. No, it, it sounds super cool. And a, and a little bit more on the BTR Tour. So if it was going to be the main draw mostly on the weekend, how many matches would, if somebody was going to go all the way through it and win it, how many matches would they play between like Friday and Sunday, for example? Just three. Simple. It starts at the quarterfinals. So again, it's, it's taking that feel of saying, hey, you can have the qualifying as large as you want. Sadly, may not have the atmosphere of the main draw, but those are guys going to work there. They're going to get paid appropriately and actually well, and then you fight your way for the main draw. But with that being said, that's where all the money that we can get comes in because, you know, then the live streaming understands the system. They understand it's going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Since our events have changed, there's going to be timed matches. So TV knows how long the matches will be. Fans know that, hey, I want to watch Noah Rubin play. His matches are one. At the worst, it goes on at one fifteen. That's the worst. Worst. It's not five o'clock. So you know, for everybody involved, I think it makes a lot of sense to get them, you know, engaged. Cool. And and would these players be? Would you take anyone in the ranking system, or is it is it targeting a certain kind of ranking level, like high or low? Is it for challenger players, or is it for like top ten players, like? Like, what's the main group? Yeah, you know, we, we understand the marketing of getting top players. Actually, we had a decent amount of players. Um, it was basically invitation only. I was going out and choosing. So almost less about the ranking and more about the person behind the ranking. We want to get people out, especially for our first year, which will be invitation-based. We want to get people out that are exciting, that are going to interact with the fans, that are going to high-five and are show their personality. Um, so we had players that were inside the top 20 in the world. We also had players that were, you know, 180 in the world that I feel like were more exciting that, you know, than, than a guy that was 60 in the world. So, you know, these are just things that we were going and, and looking at. But, you know, we understand the marketing capabilities of having somebody that's highly ranked. But we want to be strategic about the people that we pick, uh, you know, initially, because we feel like this is an, you know, an amazing opportunity for people in the main draw. It's a three-day event. You know, a maximum of basically three and a half hours of tennis throughout, and they get paid, you know, you know, pretty well. And on top of that, they're really enjoying their time. So we feel like it's a win-win, and you know, we're making sure we get you know the best people and players out. Yeah, well, it sounds great, and I'm excited to see um, what you guys can pull off and, and how it's going to go. And I'm excited to just watch in general because obviously, if you love tennis, you're going to love the BTR tour like that. A little bit more about phenom tennis you talked about it's it's the juniors it's focusing on the juniors it's also focusing on the mental health of tennis which is obviously a huge thing because i've only played at a, a low level but i know from a lot of juniors playing futures or itfs it's you know you're scraping together money to travel across the world to lose potentially in the first round and make 100 bucks and that is just tough no matter who you are so how, how can you as an organization focus on the mental health of players like how does that even work yeah, it's difficult. Um, we actually, my partner and I heard a stat recently that 40% of, of juniors, of kids that play their first tennis tournament, never play another one ever again. And that's, you know, that's, you know, you talk about a, a tremendous marketplace that we're losing out on. So for us, it's, it's looking at how do we keep them in the sport? How do we bring them in? How do we make it enticing for them? On the mental health side, at every event that we have, we're going to have an on-site sports psychologist or certified mental health professional there working with the players there to you know for the players to ask questions or parents to ask questions to really introduce them we're also working on um, a partnership with an app that has you know this mental health database that can have you know basically a day-to-day -day operations for each player or parent to say hey am i doing the things necessary to keep up because we always think about getting stronger or faster or fit, but I think mental health is finally coming into discussion of how important that is. And especially for kids in the developmental stages, we have to make sure that they're okay, first and foremost, because obviously I remember matches and tournaments from when I was that age, but 
how important were they truly in my, you know, tennis career? You know, what, what did that national open mean for my tennis career? Maybe not, not that much, but at that point in my head, it was do or die. And I think that takes a toll on parents. It takes a toll on the kids. So for us, it's about changing that culture, changing the menta- that mentality. And, and we're excited that UTR believes in us, believes in our vision, and, and we've kind of combined efforts. So, you know, this year, starting in June, we're going to have tournaments, which most of them, almost all of them will be weekend events, just two-day events, minimum of three matches. Uh, they're going to be level base matches, which I think are really interesting, which I I wish I had that growing up, you know, so a 12 year old can play a 17 year old if they're on the same level, because, you know, a 6060 match that you may play, that doesn't really do anything. I, you know, it's cool to brag to your friends that you just won that match, but what does that really do for your tennis? Not much. And, and UTR kind of being that place that college coaches are now going to, to scout and recruit. And that's what a lot of people are gunning for. You know, it's great to have this partnership and we're excited for, for what's going to come out of it. Yeah, I just I can I can't agree enough with that. Like I think you see coaches stressing to their player, or good coaches at least stressing to their players that you know it's not about the score in your match; it's about how you played, how you played for you. And then if every tournament is if they you know they come and match up against the first seed and just get killed one on one, then it doesn't like you don't really learn much from that. And even the the first seed doesn't learn much from that to be honest, right? Like like you said. So I think that. A guaranteed set of matches especially for juniors because obviously if they progress it's going to get more competitive but at least it provides them enough time on court in a match tournament environment to to grow is that is that kind of the thought behind that 100 percent. i mean you know looking at myself we actually also have martin redlicky on board who's a two-time ncaa champion one uh junior US open doubles as well you know if you're looking at him you know take me out of the question look at him i mean that's kind of the pinnacle of what these guys are gunning for. I mean, professional tennis, you're talking about such a small percentage. We're talking decimal points on decimal points. And even, you know, what Marn has accomplished on the college route in juniors is decimal points. So for a lot of these kids, it's just how can we make it enjoyable for them? How can they get so much out of tennis? They, they want to be a part of it for the rest of their lives and, and get their kids involved as well. So I think we're just missing out on that where, yes, let's develop incredible tennis players, but let's also make sure that the ones that maybe don't have those aspirations or maybe have, you know, less grand aspirations in terms of tennis, that they still have a place to play and improve and grow and then can utilize their, you know, wealth, you know, in terms of tennis knowledge for something else. And that's what we're really gunning for in the end. Yeah, awesome stuff, man. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it happen. Thank you for joining us today here on Tennis Head. How can folks get involved with the BTR Tour or Phenom Tennis if they're interested in learning more information? Uh, Where can they find you online? Yeah, go to the btrtour.com. You can also find phenomtennis.com on the same pages there. Look up everything, you know, whether you have kids that want to play. We have tournaments around the country. We're adding every day new juniors. And then to follow the uh, BTR tour, you can see a calendar on the main page, which we're starting in San Diego in January. We're really excited about. Should be perfect weather by then. And uh, no, you know, we have a lot on our plate. And you know, it's the support of people like you and everybody else spreading the message. We're, you know, we're really thankful to have the support. So thank you so much. Of course, Noah, we love what you're doing. Um, we'll chat again soon. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you.